the showcase of the immortals, the grandest stage of them all, WrestleMania. Held every spring since 1985, WrestleMania is World Wrestling Entertainment's flagship event. Acting as a sort of wrestling Super Bowl, the event showcases WWE's top stars and storylines, the ultimate yearly culmination of the company's creative efforts. And in its four-decade history, WWE has turned in some of its greatest productions, with iconic moments, unforgettable matches, and unbelievable surprises, fueling the extraordinary legacy that leaves WrestleMania in a league of its own, where the world's biggest superstars collide amidst a backdrop of roaring crowds, dazzling productions, and jaw-dropping displays of athleticism. WrestleMania isn't just an event, it's a cultural phenomenon, a beacon of excitement and anticipation that illuminates the wrestling landscape each spring. Join me today as we take a journey through the colossal history of WrestleMania, reliving some of the moments and matches that make this iconic event the benchmark for climactic and spectacular professional wrestling events. Origins of WrestleMania WrestleMania was conceptualized by former WWE Executive Chairman Vincent Kennedy McMahon with the hopes of creating an annual wrestling extravaganza that would transcend the sport and captivate audiences worldwide. An idea that many promoters frowned upon, thinking that the event would take away from the core principles of professional wrestling. McMahon, however, was committed to make his event the catalyst that would turn professional wrestling into a mainstream form of entertainment. The name WrestleMania itself was the brainchild of ring announcer and WWE Hall of Famer Howard Finkel. Finkel recalled the impact that the Beatles had made two decades earlier when they arrived in the United States. The term Beatlemania was coined to describe the frenzy surrounding the band. Drawing from this, Finkel suggested WrestleMania, and the rest is history. WrestleMania 1 The World Wrestling Federation staged its first WrestleMania on March 31, 1985, in Madison Square Garden in New York City. On this night, McMahon would go forward with his plan to elevate the event by having his talent play second fiddle to mainstream celebrities of the day, such as Cyndi Lauper, Mr. T, Liberace, and Muhammad Ali. The celebrity involvement really helped get eyes in the event and butts in seats. The main event went all out with the celebrity involvement with a tag match between WWF World Heavyweight Champion Hulk Hogan and star of Rocky III and the A-Team, Mr. T, accompanied by Jimmy Snuka against the team of Roddy Piper and Paul Orndorff, who are accompanied by Cowboy Bob Orton. The match also featured legendary boxer Muhammad Ali as the special guest referee. The match ended with Mr. T and Hogan coming out on top, a moment that added fuel to Hulkamania, making him a household name for years to come. Perhaps the one WrestleMania where the actual wrestling mattered the least, but this event was all about the spectacular sight of stars outside the wrestling world coming into the business to give it a much needed push and a little bit of credibility. The event was an enormous success for the WWF. More than a million fans watched the broadcast on closed circuit television and in theaters, as well as in the arena itself. It helped the audience associate WWF with professional wrestling, and WrestleMania quickly became an annual tradition, spawning other reoccurring pay-per-view events such as SummerSlam, Survivor Series, King of the Ring, and the Royal Rumble. The financial and critical success of the event secured the company's status as the most successful professional wrestling promotion in the United States. WrestleMania 2 Following the success of the inaugural WrestleMania, the WWF took a gamble on WrestleMania 2. It was decided that the event would be held in three separate venues across the country. The Veterans Memorial Coliseum in New York, the Rosemont Horizon in Chicago, and the Los Angeles Memorial Sports Arena. Each venue would receive one hour of programming, each with an undercard of matches and a main event. However, in hindsight, this was a detriment to the event overall as those in attendance were robbed of seeing two-thirds of the show live before having to watch the remaining two hours on large screens. The idea of running the show in three separate markets was an ill-conceived cash grab that was not effective in terms of producing a quality program. Even worse, the main event in New York was a sloppy at best boxing match pitting Mr. T against Roddy Roddy Piper that ended in a DQ thanks to Piper body slamming Mr. T. This match is often regarded as one of the worst WrestleMania main events in history. The Chicago crowd probably received the best show, with a strange 20-man battle royale between wrestlers and NFL players, including Chicago fan favorite William the Refrigerator Perry. Chicago also received probably the best main event of the night, with Davey Boy Smith and Dynamite Kid defeating Brutus Beefcake and Greg Valentine in what was certainly the match of the night overall. 
the Los Angeles crowd received the first ever world title match at WrestleMania, with WWF World Heavyweight Champion Hulk Hogan successfully defending his title against King Kong Bundy in a steel cage match. It was a less than stellar match, but still served its purpose. Ultimately, WrestleMania II was a step backward, largely in part of WWF's risky decision to use three different venues, and lacking in-ring excitement to truly take this WrestleMania to the next level. WrestleMania III In 1987, the WWF would thankfully learn from their misstep from a year prior, and move WrestleMania back to a single venue. The Pontiac Silverdome in Michigan was selected to host the third rendition of WrestleMania. The WWF claimed that the paid attendance was 93,173, which would have made it the largest recorded attendance at a live event in North American history. In what today seems like a bit of an unethical business practice, to make certain that every seat in the Pontiac Silverdome would be filled, the WWF decided to exclude the entire state of Michigan from pay-per-view access to the event, which mean attending the event was the only way for fans in Michigan to see it. However, retrospective analysis of the event has determined that the actual attendance was around 78,000, still impressive, but not the staggering number they had claimed. Despite this, WrestleMania 3 is still remembered very fondly in the hearts of wrestling fans, often being marked as the pinnacle of the 1980s wrestling boom. The highlight of the event was undoubtedly the main event featuring Hulk Hogan defending the WWF World Heavyweight Championship against Andre the Giant. The moment when Hulk Hogan slammed Andre is one of the most iconic moments in wrestling history, further cementing Hogan's superstardom. Even still to this day, the legendary image of the Hulkster slamming the 500 pound giant opens every single WWE event. With all that being said, the match that stole the show from an in-ring standpoint was Ricky Steamboat defeating Macho Man Randy Savage for the Intercontinental title in what was the first truly great WrestleMania match. This match truly set the bar for future WrestleMania matches, a prime example that displayed that the show-stealing bout at the Showcase of the Immortals could be a career-defining moment remembered forever. WrestleMania 4 WrestleMania 4 was held at the Atlantic City Convention Hall in New Jersey, though on the broadcast it was billed as being held in the Trump Plaza Hotel because the adjacent casino hotel was the event's primary sponsor. The main selling point was a 14-man single elimination tournament to crown a new WWF World Heavyweight Champion, with four non-tournament matches to fill the gaps between the tournament rounds. This was the first and only time a tournament like this was held at WrestleMania, and it's probably for the best, as the amount of matches made the whole event seem rushed. Meaning that by the time we got to the final match between Macho Man Randy Savage and Ted DiBiase, they didn't really have enough time to produce a classic match in under 10 minutes. Though it was great to see Randy Savage finally triumph in the end, but the show could have done better with his pacing. In addition, this would be the only WrestleMania out of the first nine where Hulk Hogan did not wrestle in the main event. Not that he wasn't involved, he helped Savage win the match and celebrated with Savage and Miss Elizabeth, slowly planting the seeds for the eventual clash between the two icons. WrestleMania 5 WrestleMania 5 returned the event to Atlantic City for the second year in a row and would continue the saga between Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage. Having tagged together for some time, the two men came to be known as the Mega Powers, but jealousy over Hogan's popularity and Miss Elizabeth, Savage's wife and manager, caused a rift between the two. This led to WrestleMania V being billed as the Mega Powers Explode. Savage and Hogan would face off in the main event for the WWF World Heavyweight Championship. Miss Elizabeth chose to remain neutral in this match, but ultimately was ejected from ringside after too many complications were caused by her attempting to assist both men at different points in the match. Hogan would ultimately prevail, winning his second WWF world title. Other than a good match between Ultimate Warrior and Rick Rude, the Mega Powers match is honestly the only thing a lot of people remember about this WrestleMania, as the undercard fell a bit flat. But it did provide us with Shawn Michaels' WrestleMania debut, be it in a losing effort. But it would be the start of his long WrestleMania career, where he would eventually earn the moniker of Mr. WrestleMania. WrestleMania 6 the first time WrestleMania took place outside of the United States was at WrestleMania 6, which was held at the Sky Dome in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. This night was again all about the main event. They took two of the best superstars they had, two of the biggest fan favorites, and put them head to head, creating a great big match atmosphere. In one corner you had Hulk Hogan, the face of the company and the world champ, who had dominated the 1980s. 
And in the other corner, you had the incredibly intense Ultimate Warrior, who had rocketed his way to the top of the WWF card in a relatively short time, becoming the Intercontinental Champion. The match would be a title for title match, and really felt like either man could come out on top, a situation not often seen during this era, especially with Hogan involved. The two would put on a solid match that was brought to another level thanks to the electrified crowd. The Ultimate Warrior would in the end be victorious in a somewhat of a passing of the torch moment, with all this making this one of the best WrestleMania main events in the early years. But yet again, the undercard left much to be desired. WrestleMania 7 The event returned to the United States for WrestleMania 7, which was originally scheduled to be held outdoors at the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. But due to poor ticket sales, the event was moved to the adjacent, indoors, Los Angeles Memorial Sports Arena. In storyline, this change of venues was sold as being part of security reasons related to the Gulf War. In the build, Sergeant Slaughter, who for years had been a flag-waving American patriot, shockingly pledged allegiance to Saddam Hussein and the Iraqi regime. He would be booked to clash with WWF's proud American hero, Hulk Hogan, at WrestleMania. A pretty wild storyline to say the least, that of course ended with Hogan dropping a desert storm like atomic leg drop on the traitorous turncoat Sergeant Slaughter, as was his duty as a real American. Gotta love these outrageous golden era WWF storylines. The match of the night though was a classic between the Ultimate Warrior and Randy Savage, with the intriguing stipulation that the loser must leave the WWF. The match was suspensional from start to finish, filled with near falls that kept the audience on their toes. In the end, the Ultimate Warrior would pin Savage, retiring him. Well, at least for a little while. It wasn't all bad news for Savage, though, as he was reunited with Miss Elizabeth in a heartfelt moment after the match. WrestleMania 7 is also notable for being the first Undertaker match at WrestleMania, making his debut by defeating Jimmy Superfly Snuka, kicking off his legendary streak at WrestleMania. WrestleMania 8. The next edition of the show, WrestleMania 8, was a night of what could have been. In the build-up, it was announced that in the main event, the face of the WWF, Hulk Hogan, would face off against NWA legend Ric Flair, seen by many wrestling fans as the greatest wrestler in the world. An absolute dream match for many at the time. However, this was later changed to a double main event. Flair would now defend the title against Macho Man Randy Savage, while Hulk Hogan would face Sid Justice. While Savage and Flair were always going to and did put on a great match, probably the match of the night alongside Bret Hart versus Roddy Piper in a very entertaining match, it just seemed like they missed the boat. As Hogan versus Flair would have been an absolute opportunity and a huge box office attraction. Not to mention that Hogan vs. Sid Justice was an overbooked, sloppy mess that ended in a DQ. In the years since, Hogan and Flair would clash in both WCW and WWE, in matches that just didn't feel the same as what could have been. In hindsight, it seems that both men's egos got in the way of what could have been an absolutely fantastic main event at WrestleMania 8. WrestleMania 9 In the first ever WrestleMania held in an outdoor venue at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, WrestleMania 9 did a pretty fantastic job with its Roman Coliseum theming, in my opinion at least. It's really something I can appreciate. Other than that, nothing else was done very well at all, leaving WrestleMania 9 easily in the running for worst WrestleMania ever, if not downright the worst ever. I don't really feel like revisiting this dumpster fire of an event, so let's quickly hit some of the lowlights. First off, everything was super rushed due to the WWE spending so much time in court thanks to the steroid trial in the lead up. To start the show, there was an entrance for Julius Caesar and Cleopatra on an elephant, and it was pretty cool, but announcing him as the emperor is just historically inaccurate. This was also JR's first event with the company, and they forced him to wear a toga. This event also took place during the day, and there's points during the event where the shade makes it hard to really see anything. The best match of the night was the opening match between Shawn Michaels and Tanaka, but it ended in a count out, so that isn't saying much. We also got easily The Undertaker's worst streak match when he defeated Giant Gonzalez by DQ after the naked Bigfoot-like wrestler took The Undertaker out with chloroform. I will say though, that The Undertaker's entrance was pretty cool though. There was also the fact that Doink the Clown probably had one of the best matches on the card. What a terrible WrestleMania this was. And then finally, Yokozuna winning the WWF Championship from Bret Hart only to lose 
to Hulk Hogan mere minutes later for no good reason other than a cheap pop from a Vegas crowd that didn't really know much or care much about what was going on. WrestleMania 10. WrestleMania 10 returned to Madison Square Garden where it all began to put on a show that is basically the exact opposite from the crap they served up a year prior. The night kicked off with an absolutely classic pure wrestling match between Owen Hart defeating his elder brother Bret the Hitman Hart. This match did a great job at allowing Owen to step out of his brother's shadow while still protecting Bret as a threat later in the night. This WrestleMania also featured a couple interesting stipulation matches, the first being an entertaining Falls Count Anywhere match between Randy Savage and Crush, while also treating fans to a revolutionary show-stealing ladder match for the WWF Intercontinental Championship in which Razor Ramon defeated Shawn Michaels. Both men pulled off some outrageous moves, especially for the time, captivating the audience and setting the bar for future ladder matches. In the main event, Bret Hart, seeking redemption for his loss earlier in the night, won the WWF World Heavyweight Championship from Yokozuna, establishing himself as the unquestioned face of the company. As his brother looked on in jealousy, the 10th installment of WrestleMania is my personal favorite of the first 10 WrestleManias, and still remains a testament to how spectacular the event can be when done properly.